a few announcements that, yeah, there it is. <laughs> You're awake now, everybody awake, everybody awake. All right, um, just a few announcements before we begin class. Christian Woman Magazine, if you would like to renew or get a subscription, if you've never had one before, to Christian Woman Magazine, that money is due to Lynette McDonald uh, by March 21st. You can leave it in her mailbox and make the checks out to Christian uh, Woman Magazine for $21.50. There will be a men's church uh, softball league, and it starts pretty soon. The games will be played on Thursday nights. The cost is $50, and you can sign up through Jonathan Penrod, and that needs to be completed by March the 30th. Remember, we've restarted our Sunday morning classes, and there will be, uh, we had one class for adults this past Sunday, but we're going to go to two uh, classes for adults this coming Sunday. Uh, we ha don't have the names of them yet, or I guess we'll continue his, and there'll be an additional adult class uh, that starts this Sunday. Then we have classes for cr uh, cradle roll, one-year-old, two- to three-year-olds, four-year-olds to kindergarten, first and second grade, and then third through fifth grade, and then, of course, the young people will be with, uh, youngsters will be with Jonathan. Uh, Trevor Boyle's sister, Marie Sharp, is now in hospice in Jonesboro, Arkansas, so we need to remember her, and Teresa Story is in the hospital with a kidney stone, and that is some kind of pain to have one of those, so uh, let's, let's have a word of prayer at this time. for Our Heavenly Father, we come to you thankful for the blessings of this day, and we appreciate the opportunity to get together and study your word and have fellowship with one another and share our thoughts and as we go through these three letters we are thankful for the record that was left for us to give us instruction and guidance uh, through the inspired word father we are mindful of those who have uh, family members who are ill uh, we need to uh, check on them and help us to remember them we ask your blessings upon them and bless us as we study tonight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, there are handouts on the two front pews and then back between the red chairs if, if I didn't catch you to give, give you one so you can watch there. Just a little bit of housekeeping. Remember that the outline is basically 1 Timothy and as we go through 1 Timothy, when topics cross over to something that Paul said in 2 Timothy and Titus, we'll bring those in. So it's a topical, uh, a topical lesson of the of lessons of the scriptures, so we'll go through in that manner. And remember there's, uh, we're live streaming through YouTube, and so I'll be watching, uh, when I look down at my phone here, it's because I want to see if someone sent a question through. So I'm not trying to ignore, <laughs> ignore everybody or be rude or anything like that, but I want to be sure and give them an opportunity. There's eight computers that are tuned in right now, and so we don't know how many people, a couple of, uh, I did get a reach out from a couple of folks uh, this week that are viewing, and we want to make sure to include everyone as much as possible. I'll, when you ask a question, I'll repeat it so that they can hear it. And if I get a question through uh, the viewing, then I'll repeat it so everybody can, can participate and hear it. And for those who are viewing on YouTube, I've learned, I figured out last week there's a little bit of a lag. Uh, and so it may be a minute or two before a question pops up if you send a question through or make a comment. I just figured this out. Me and Barry talked about all this <laughs> before, what his struggles and, uh, that he had. And we're trying to figure it out, and we're, we're learning as we go. So anyway, so tonight is vain babblings and silly arguments. And remember our theme verse, 1 Timothy 3.15, I write so that you may know how to conduct yourself in the house of God which is the church of the living God. And just an emphasis that I want to make, Paul said how you ought to conduct yourself, not how they or them. It's very personal. It's you. And so we should take this letter as, Tommy, this is the expectation for you. And each one of us would look and, and see, these are the expectations for me. It's not about, well, I'm going to point out everybody else's flaw. It's about looking inward. And so Paul addressed it in that way. He gave us greeting. It's interesting to me, uh, 
you can see things that are important to Paul. He wrote quite a bit about these vain babblings, arguments, and things like that. If you, you know, look at your handout, there's several, a lot of scripture listed there where he addressed that. So it was a big deal. It was important to him, and so it's important, it got to be important to us. I gave you a quote from the guy who wrote the book Bad Science because I thought it was interesting. It says, you cannot reason people out of a position they did not reason themselves into. And that's very true. A lot of people make decisions based on emotion, not really logic and reason, so it's difficult to deal with, uh, to deal with that. He also will address the spiritual condition that he, he, called, he addressed it, called it a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. And those are very important uh, to Paul also. So we'll be talking a lot, though, about what are vain babblings and silly arguments. That's kind of the main thing. Another deal to remember is probably, I know I have been guilty, but we have all been, at one time or another, that person that got all worked up about something that really wasn't that important. It shouldn't have been that important. But we've probably all been there where sometimes it's, for me, it's my wife looking at me like, you have lost your mind. And we've probably all, all been there, and maybe your husband looks at you like, what? <laughs> But we've all been there. We've, we've all been guilty of, of getting worked up on things that are not uh, worth getting worked up about and topics that aren't uh, that critical. So anyway, so as we go through the scriptures, I'm going to just briefly go through. And so we'll be going First Timothy, Second Timothy, and Titus. So we'll be going back and forth uh, quite a bit. So in First Timothy uh, verse 1, verses 3 to 11, if you look at verse 4, he says, don't give heed genealogies and he says now the purpose in verse 5 the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart from a good conscience and from a sincere faith and that's that's an important the way he said that is so important in verse 8 he says the law is good and we'll address that a little bit then if you skip down to the end of first timothy in chapter 6 verses 20 and 21 he says guard what was committed to your trust avoiding the profane and idle babblings and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. Then in 2 Timothy, he, bring, he brings it up again because it's important and it causes this dissension and strife. And in verse 14 of chapter 2 of 2 Timothy, remind them of these things, charging them before the Lord not to strive about words to no profit to the end of their hearers. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, but shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness. And he calls that message like, uh, like a cancer. Skipping on down the same, uh, in, into the next paragraph in verse 23 of chapter 2. Avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, is the way the King James, New King James translates it, that they generate strife. Verse 24, the servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition. That, and skipping down to verse 26, that they may, may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil. I think what Paul's getting across there is the devil uses these disputes and these dissensions among us to, to cause division, to spread ill feelings and ill will towards one another. And Titus, some of the same message again. Foolish disputes, genealogies, contentions, strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and useless. Verse 11, such a person is warped and sinning. So Paul really doesn't mince any words, and the language that is translated into is pretty blunt uh, when you think about it. Um, as you go through, I just kind of... I've used the term vain babblings and silly arguments, but as you go through, I want to give you some of the other words that other translations uh, put, in, uh, put in place, like in, um, in 1 Timothy 6.20, the New American Standard, instead of babbling, worldly and empty. Uh, then in 2 Timothy 2, uh, verse uh, 16, it calls it irreverent babble. 
and the NIV calls it godless chatter. Then in 2 Timothy 2.23, 2, uh, 2, the NIV says foolish and stupid. Wow. Wow. And then the New American Standard calls it speculations. So as we go through, so you think about it. The words that were used, unprofitable, useless, foolish, ignorant, profane, worldly, stupid, irreverent, godless, fables, babblings, and world, words to no profit. So these kind of things, what, what do they do to the brethren in the church? What happens? Tell me, what, do you, what happens when you start getting into these kind of irreverent, these silly arguments? What happens? Division. People get their feelings hurt. They get mad at one another. Exactly. Exactly. Now, he, a couple of times he mentioned genealogy. What was the important? Why would the Jews be hung up on genealogies? Think about it. Why would the Jews be hung up on genealogies? If you think back to our study in Ezra and Nehemiah, what was the importance of keeping up with the genealogies uh, that they that Ezra and Nehemiah had to do? What was what was going on there? Exactly. It was to, make, to keep the priesthood and the Levites pure because only that uh, tribe could serve in those roles, so they had to keep up with it. They also had to make sure, if I, you said you were a Jew, that you really were because there was a land inheritance involved. So, yes, exactly. So it was important to them. But under the New Covenant, what part does genealogy play in the New Covenant? It's all through Christ, isn't it? Genealogy means nothing. Birthright really means, means nothing to God. I've given you John chapter 1, verses 13. But as many as received him, he gave the right to become children of God. If you receive God, accept him, you have the right to become a child of God. And he goes on to say, To those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. A child of God is someone who not born into a certain tribe, born into a certain family, born to a certain person, is someone who makes the choice that they believe God and they're going to follow his, they are going to follow his will. That's the only requirement. It's the only requirement. So, we've already mentioned that these are, all these cause disputes on godliness. And I want to make a, give you a comment that came from uh, David Lipscomb in the, uh, the uh, Gospel Advocate commentary that I thought was very interesting because there are some things that they, they ha we know they have to be discussed. They have to be defended. And we don't want to you know, have a brawl out in the foyer over something, but they, there are certain things. But he, he made a comment that I thought was very interesting. He said, too much attention is given to too much attention given to error may and often does lead to errors. As a rule, men who become what he called hobby riders are not benefited by discussion. When, when a man exalts one truth above another truth in the Bible and teaches that to the neglect of other truth, he does evil and not good. So what was he driving at when he said that? He called, and I, um, an old time... Preacher, when I was in my teens, used to say that he's that preacher's a hobby rider. He would he would say that. Don't don't get on a hobby and just ride that to death. What what were they talking? What are they talking about then? How, give me an example. You can think of something. Come on. <laughs> yes. Yes, there have been, uh, and I can uh, remember when, uh, when uh, we were living in Springdale, uh, went to the South, Tom it was a South Thompson Street church then, it's Robinson Avenue now, but just down the street was a, can you, can you say it, Annie, <laughs> and Annie 
group and they didn't want to do uh, any support for children's homes and there were those disputes and there, there was a division there and Springdale at that time is not the 75,000 people there was probably 10 or 15,000 at the most then so you had you know the church split so what a great example that was wasn't it for the community but getting hung up on things and saying but I also I think it drives towards uh, something that is doctrinal and I want to give you an example in Matthew 23 uh, 23 Jesus was was really lashing out at the Pharisees and he said something that I think is interesting there and really applies to this he said woe to you scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites you pay a tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the way to your matters of the law justice mercy and faith now here's the what I, I think the key those you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. He didn't say, this is weightier, so do it and don't do the other. He said, you got to do both. you got to have balance. And so he was condemning. They were getting hung up. Oh, I'm going to weigh out that 10% of this little, you know, <laughs> 15 cent cumin here, and, I, and I'm going to neglect the widows and orphans. And that's what he was out, out about. They were getting hung up on technical aspects and beating that to death and ignoring everything else he says you ought to have done without leaving the others undone so anyway so can a good discussion about a serious topic can it turn into a hobby absolutely absolutely uh, let me think throw something else out there is there one sin in God's eyes that's worse than another sin? Sin is sin. Uh, I'm going to say, I may say some things. I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but sometimes we in the church are guilty of this. Um, how important is divorce and remarriage? It's very important, isn't it? But do we elevate the sin of homosexuality over and above the sin of divorce and get more worked up about that than getting worked up about divorce that is rampant in our nation? Rampant. We get worked up about homosexuality and that sin, and it is a sinful behavior. It's not acceptable. How many, how many marriages end up in divorce today? Anybody want to get, gather? It's over half. It's over half. But let's get worked up about all of it. Let's preach about all of it. It's not one sin worse than another. You know, Judy, I think that's a great point. And for those who are listening, it's easier to understand maybe that concept of one sin over another or make sense how can, yes, I totally agree with you. I think that's a great point. And it is something that we don't, if we don't understand, comprehend it, don't conceive of it in any, any way, it's, it's easier to pick that out and say that, oh, oh, you know, over and above something else. The point I, I'm really trying to make is let's don't elevate one sin and make it worse than any other and then any other sin. The things that Paul did before he was converted, the, the things that he did to the church, the people he sent, all of those things, but yet he was, he was forgiven. So anyway, so as we continue uh, along those things, uh, Paul told Timothy to guard what was committed and that had the that had the implication of uh, don't believe everything you hear in the Truth For Today commentary or uh, avoiding that. He said to avoid those people. So is avoiding people over foolish and controversial arguments that don't mean anything the same as, uh, if we avoid them, is it the same as ignoring it? I'm not trying to ask a trick question here. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't see it as, as, you know, to avoid those people, to stay away from it. Sometimes we do have to deal with it, don't we? We work with, yes. 
we have to deal with some of those things. But there gets to be a point, and one of the, uh, in the Truth For Today commentary made a point, he says, you know, you, you talk for a while and you talk for a while, but if you see that it's just, it's just getting to the point where that part, you know, someone is not going to listen, they're not going to accept the, 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 what the word says, or they're going to drag it into the, into the gutter. He says there is a point where you're just casting pearls before the swine, and you just need to go on, move along, because some people are just not going to deal with what's really important. And so as we try to think about things like this that are vain arguments and foolish arguments and vain babblings and all of these kind of, kind of things, uh, David Lipscomb in his commentary on, on Timothy and Titus said, really everything that's not commanded by God in the scripture can be safely placed in this. So if it's not a commandment of God, if it's not something there that we can put our uh, hand on the verb, then it really doesn't need to be argued about. Then you know it's not that it's not like that, and so we'll we'll continue. I want to give some more ex examples, but I think this um, that helps in that. Uh, it talks about the questions that divert from the word and divert from what's important in the church. The I got a comment from um, uh, online here uh, from George. It's like. It's like a fib. It will grow out of control, and you will have to deal with it. That's, <laughs> that's true, George. <laughs> Little fibs get to be bigger fibs and bigger fibs and bigger fibs, don't they? Get to growing. Thanks. Thank you for that comment. All right. I want to thank, uh, give you an example, I think, that Paul addressed in the New Testament, and that's in 1 Corinthians 3. He was talking about division in the church. And he was, talk, he was really, he was giving him a good tongue lashing from the apostle's standpoint. And he says, for one person will say, I am of Paul. Another will say, I am of Apollos. And he says, you're, you're carnal. Who's Paul? Who's Apollos? We're just ministers. But if you say, you keep saying, well, Paul baptized me. Apollos baptized me. Who cares? Right? Who cares? It's not a big deal. But the church was being divided over that as if saying that, well, an apostle baptized me. So, you know, today uh, I, I think of an example back um, years ago. Again, I'm going to go back to Springdale again. We had some citywide meetings and Jimmy Allen uh, was the evangelist. And I mean, those who heard him in his prime, he could lay it down, you know. And there were lots of people who came and were baptized and, and came into the church, but he didn't baptize any of them. He had members from the church there in Springdale do the baptizing because he didn't, he didn't want to get drawn into that deal. And at the time, I was, just, you know, I was young and I was going, well, you know, he did all the work. Why didn't he, you know, <laughs> he did all the work up there sweating out that, you know, we were, it was an outdoor thing and it was in the summer, it was hot. He did all the work. He didn't want to get down in the water there. But looking back, I see what he was, what he was doing. He's getting out of that, I, not into that. So I, I think that's maybe kind of what Paul is driving at here. So let's get, to, let's, let's get more into some meddling here for exa examples of today's Christian. Uh, you know, sometimes God is given uh, credit or blame for things we need to be careful about giving him blame or credit. Now, let me, and I want to I go to a secular example out there in the world that you've probably seen in the news today. And I, I, went, to, I went to school in Texas. I, you know, I spent some years in Texas. And you know what? The eyes of Texas was a big deal when I was in school. It was a big deal. We sang it every morning before we started. We did the eyes of Texas and the Pledge of Allegiance. Buddy, we better belt out the eyes of Texas. Well, you know, if you've seen the news, it's a big deal right now. And people are getting worked up. Getting worked up. It's a song. It's a song. But I know it's a big deal to some of those folks. A big deal. Some people hate it. Some people love it. And some people, it's a tradition. It's a tradition thing. And I promise you, I haven't seen it. But I'm sure there's been some heated conversations about that song among friends, Christian friends, maybe even the church lobby, because there was a time I saw two 
Now, you know, the week of Texas and Texas A&M game, you talk, <laughs> that's a big deal. People would stop on the side of the freeway and duke it out. And I looked around, I was a youngster, I thought, y'all are crazy. I'm a, I'm a Razorback. <laughs> I don't want in this. And people, that, yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yes, exactly. Woo pig suey, yeah, that'd get people work. But uh, I saw Christian brothers get upset about A and M and the Longhorn games. I, it's a game. And so, as a Christian, we look at that. And I want to read a passage of scripture that I think is pertinent to all of this. In Romans fourteen, receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things. There's just some things that doesn't, doesn't matter. And so we care, do we care more about our brother and sister in Christ or do we care more about winning an argument? Um, Sean Alred told me that uh, some advice his daddy gave him a couple of weeks before he got married. He said, look, here's how it goes, son. You can be right or you can be happy. And Sean figured that out. He told me after he'd been married for a while, do you want to win an argument or do you want to have a happy house? And he figured that out the older he got. And that's so true. Do we want to be right or do we want to be happy? Do we care about our brother and sister in Christ? He says, for he who believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. Let not him who eats despise him who does not eat, and let not him who does not eat judge him who eats, for God has received him. Who are you to judge another servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day above another, another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord, and he who does not observe the day to, to the Lord, he does not observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord, for he gives God thanks. And he who does not eat to the Lord, he does not eat, and, God give, and gives God thanks. None of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. And if we have that kind of attitude in the, in the things, the day-to-day -day things that we deal with in the church, then the church is going to be in much, much better shape, and there'll be less disputing and argument. So let's think about some things that, that I, you may have seen these, I've seen some things, but people give God credit, a, a lot of credit and put him into ev current events of the day in uh, politics or any kind of things. We don't know what God is doing all the time. We don't know those things. But there's some people want to put God in the in current events that are going on, whatever it is, especially if your side's winning or your side's losing. And um, then I've heard Christians talking about, well, God is a Democrat or God is a Republican or he's a Libertarian. God ain't none of that. He is not any of that. But I, I can tell you from personal experience, I've had... Christian people that I care about a lot. One person tell me, you can't be a Democrat and be a Christian. I've had another Christian man tell me, you can't be a Christian and be a Republican. Because the brother and sisters, that ain't right. That has no place in the church. That's worldly things. We're, we care about people's souls. We care about taking care of the poor. And, and converting people to Christ, not to any particular party or any particular political sway. That's not what the church is about. Some people give God credit for natural disasters, and we probably see, you know, a city nearly gets wiped out by a hurricane. Well, they deserved it. I don't, how do you know? I don't, I don't know. We don't know the things that God does. Uh, there's areas of judgment that the elders make on church decisions. They're, they're judgment things. They are not to be argued about. 
But there are doctrinal things, yes. We'll discuss those there, but there are some, some things that are judgment. Um, in history, um, the best reason you can give to go out and kill everybody in another nation is to say it's God's will. There's been more people killed in the name of God than probably any other reason because it's always the godless heathen that we're going to kill in war. God has used, if you go back to the Old Testament, God used evil nations to accomplish his will. He used evil nations to accomplish his will. He used Israel to accomplish his will. We don't know. God has not given us a line of communication to tell us, I'm doing this, this, and this. It may be, you know, it may be just two nations, they got into it, and they're going to fight it out. And God didn't have anything to do with it. The only thing we can say is God's not going to let something happen that he doesn't want to happen. It won't happen. If God doesn't want something to happen, it's not happening. Period. There will be a way. Got another comment online. Uh, look at any hurricane and where it hits, like New Orleans, uh, again from Georgia. That's true. That you know, I heard people say New Orleans, that, that's a sinful city and all that stuff going on down there. And uh, when Hurricane Katrina, they, they deserved it. There's lots of Christian people. I've, I've worshipped with churches in, in New Orleans. I, they suffered right along. We don't, we don't know. We don't know those things. God is above us. He doesn't tell us everything he's doing. It's up to us to accept God in our life in the way that we should live and the way that we should act and just worry about me. He'll take care of the world. And, he'll, and maybe at some point, maybe he'll reveal that to us when we're with him in heaven. Maybe he won't. I don't know. But we don't know those. We don't know all those things. But these are things that, that people in the church, and this is these, these silly arguments, these vain babblings, these discussions that go nowhere but get people upset. And the church is not about that. The church is about supporting one another, encouraging one another, edifying one another, teaching the lost, taking care of the orphans, taking care of widows. taking It's about that. It's not about this other stuff that we get all worked up about, you know, the color of the carpet even. All right, I got a couple of com had I saw someone's hand over here. No? Just Barry. Uh, for those who are listening online, I'll try to summarize what you said, Barry. And if I say something wrong, you stick your hand up. But sometimes it's hard to determine, and people feel like that God intervened in maybe something that they're going through. Um, I, I can tell you, I know of, you know, in, of cases that I wonder, how did that person live? How did they live? That I have no explanation. I, I can tell you that I know that you know the circumstances. They should have died. They should have. They should be dead. But they didn't. I don't know. Maybe God gave them another chance. I, you don't know. Here's your warning. Slap. Pow. I, you know. I. I don't know. We don't. We. We don't know. Yeah, 
again, I'm going to repeat your comment for, for those that are for those that are listening. Um, and now I've already forgot it. You have to say it again. <laughs> nothing. There's nothing wrong with me. I'm fine. <laughs> oh, that's it. People, thank you, Adam. Thank you for. I'm glad you were listening. <laughs> Oh, me, yes. It's that rock bottom thing. Let me, let me repeat this and then I'll get to you, okay? Uh, that sometimes people have to hit that, that bottom before they, they'll change. There is a whole group of people in AA that say that very thing, right? You've got to hit rock bottom before you'll make a change on that. Barfield? I, I think you're exactly right. You're absolutely right, and again, I'll repeat the comment, is that we sometimes say that it's an intervention from Jesus because we don't have an ex. We, we can't explain it. We don't know how it happened. We can't explain it. We know it should have been much worse than it was, but it wasn't, and we can't explain it, and that's, that's how we do. And, you know, we do, the, we do the best we can. Probably each one of us could go back in our life and think about events that happened to... Make, that changed the course of their life, that they met the right person who brought them to, to Jesus. They uh, made a move that put them in a congregation that gave them the spiritual needs that they, that they needed, or they met the person that they ended up uh, marrying. That happened, and you look and you go, I don't know how, how, how all that worked out but it sure did work out good for me. And so it's hard to explain that. And you, and you wonder, did God, you know, and there's a couple times in my life that I look back and I go, you know, we could have made a different decision and it would, couldn't have, might not have worked out as good as this did. I, you know, I don't know. Um, I had an example from uh, some missionaries that uh, this congregation supported back years ago. They, they've since passed away, but they were in Africa for, for years. They moved their whole family there. And they were talking about they were going from one village to another, and this is very remote, isolated, and we're talking about dirt trails. We're not talking about roads. We're talking about dirt trails that they go from one village to another. And they got out and got lost. They, were lost. they didn't have a clue, and it's getting dark, and the one thing they didn't need to be is in the middle of the jungle in the dark. Not live. and they just said we're lost and they were getting scared and so they kneeled down and prayed and said example and they heard a, a rooster crow and they knew that was probably where the village was and, the, and he said don't know explain that don't know I can't got another comment uh, Jesus handled it by saying it is written every issue that I've had that was hardest to defend started was started by saying I think instead of saying it is written <laughs> that's a great comment uh, we get ourselves in trouble by saying I think and the, the comment here when Jesus was confronted after 40 days of starving when the devil confronted him his answer was each time it is written it is written it is written Great, great comment. Thank you for that. 
So, moving on, Paul has really hammered this about, about that, and he does, he does throw in some other things I think are important. Need to check our, how's our time going here. But uh, he talked about the law being good, and it was good. It served a purpose. It did accomplish what it was supposed to accomplish, and the purpose of the law, he said the law is good if one uses it lawfully in 1 Timothy 1.8. So what was the purpose of the law? It was to bring us to Christ. That was the purpose of the law. In Galatians 3, 23 through 25, it says we were kept under guard by the law, and it was a tutor. And this tutor here is not the tutor that we think of today being the person who teaches you. The tutor, the translation is a pedagogue, that this person was responsible for the children after school and to make sure they got home from school and that they got to school the next day. Basically, this person was to keep them out of trouble till the next day, next day of school. Uh, and so that was what the law was to do. Here's, here's some things you got to do to stay out of trouble until the perfect law of liberty comes. And that, that was its function. And it accomplished, it accomplished that. So now, probably the last part of our our discussion, a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. Burton Kaufman in his commentary on this verse in 1 Timothy 1 and verse 5 said, this is the end. This is Christianity, is to have the commandment of love which comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. Those three things make us the kind of Christian that we need to be. And it, this, this love is a, the agape love, which is you know, selfish provision uh, for others. It's the love that God has for mankind and the, law, and the love that God expects of us. He expects of us. So, you know, when Jesus was confronted and he was asked, well, what's the best law? What's the big law? He, he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And so when Jesus laid down his law on, the Mount, on Mount Sinai, he said, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good. He says, you do all those things that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. That's in Matthew 5. He said, you got to do these things if you want to be a child of God. And so in, in some regards, that's the foundation of the new covenant is love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our might. If we do those things, then all this other stuff won't, it don't matter. It don't matter because we'll be doing the important, the important stuff. It takes all three of these things. And I'm looking for it. We've got just a couple of minutes. I'm going to look and see where I want to break and finish next week. But it takes all three of these conditions to, um, to make us the kind of Christian. Can you have a clear conscience and be wrong? No. Bill said yes. Paul had a clear, absolutely a clear conscience, and he was as wrong as he could be. Right. So it's more than just one thing. Can you have a pure heart and be wrong? That's a little tougher, isn't it? Exactly. And, you know, the example I thought of... Uh, in Acts 18, 25, this man had been instructed in the way and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he only knew the baptism of John. I would say he had a pure heart. He just needed more teaching. His pure heart allowed him to be taught, though, because he was pure in heart. He was honest in what he was doing. And so... Can you have a pure heart? Can you, uh, Charles? Go ahead. That is an excellent question. And for those listening, uh, 
Can you have a pure heart and be saved? So let's stop for a minute. I didn't have that question written down, but I like it. It's a good one. It's a good one. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 8, what did he say? Blessed are the pure in heart for what? They what? They shall see God. They shall see God. Yes, sir. Now, see, now you're meddling. <laughs> That's a, that is a good one. Uh, what is a, a pure heart exactly? Because, you know, I look at the Beatitudes. Another one of the Beatitudes says, what? If you hunger and thirst for righteousness, you what? Shall be filled. So, if you have a pure heart, you're going to see God. So let's talk about what is a pure heart. What is it? I got an opinion, but I like to hear. It's a great question. What is a pure? What is have? What is a pure heart? <laughs> well, sometimes that's the best way to figure out what it is. What is it not? It's not what. It's not a clear conscience. Okay, let me repeat so the people listening online can hear, and I'll get to you and then to Tim, and then we'll probably run out of time and we'll finish next week. But um, I forgot what I was going to say now. <laughs> Everybody's raising their hand. It's not a clear conscience. Now remember, what, it, thank you for repeating it because now I remember what I was going to say. Where did Jesus say actions start? Pardon? From the heart. Barry, what were you going to say? And then I'll get to Tim. Okay. All right. I want to get, give Tim. Okay. Now, let me repeat your comment for those online here. You still make, you can have a pure heart, still make mistakes. David had a, was a man after God's own heart, and he made, he made plenty. He made plenty. Pardon? We're human, exactly. An active, here's another comment for online. An active soul seeking the best in others and always looking towards the good. I'm guessing he means that that's what a pure, a pure heart is. Um, I'll make one last comment on this, and then this is where we'll pick up. This is great discussion, y'all. It's really important because Paul put, you know, he talked about this being... This is where agape, agape love starts. In my mind, what part of the body or what part of the spirit receives the word? And really, what, what is that part that receives the word? I would say it's the heart, wouldn't you? The, that's where it, where it starts. Because as Jesus said, that's where good, bad, or indifferent actions come. That's where it starts in the heart. So, this discussion on the heart is where we'll pick up next week. And I really appreciate the comments and the questions. Great questions and great comments. And we'll pick it up uh, there next week. And I do really appreciate it. Thank you.